Hello everyone, welcome to TechShare Pro. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, thanks for joining us now. For those of you who've been around during the day, welcome back. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, the final um, keynote for the day. We've got some three amazing sessions. We're going to be talking to uh, the founder of Kahoot about how they built a unicorn using inclusive design. We're going to be speaking to Valuable 500 about the work they're doing now beyond their initial announcement. If, for those of you who heard from Caroline Casey this morning about hitting the 500 and moving on, we're going to be finding out a lot more about what they're actually doing now with their um, 500 uh, CEOs from around the world who've made a commitment to disability inclusion. And then we've got a fantastic session at the end uh, where we're going to hear from uh, Rob Riley from WPP, uh, Phil Spencer from Xbox, and Cindy Rose from Microsoft about the brand value of accessibility. Um, and the join in all of this really is the what are we doing, why are we doing it uh, for an accessibility and inclusion event. What are we doing about trying to change the way the world works? How are we involving business and decision makers and leaders? Um, and how do we hook into that and make change happen at scale? Uh, that's really where we're going to next. So before we do that, I just want to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we wouldn't be here if we didn't have uh, uh, an amazing support. So Microsoft is our key sponsor. Then we've got Barclays, Google, Intuit, Meta, and Sony, and also a whole host of other support from other organizations, Attendable, Business Disability Forum, Code Mantra, DAT Europe, Digit Music, IAAP, IT Pro, RNIB, Text Help, UK Association for Accessible Formats and the Valuable 500. Um, I think the connection between all of those names and brands and, and organizations is that we're all attempting to make a digital world that's accessible to all. Um, but I know that you know, building that uh, uh, accessible world is not one person's job. And I think this section we're going to be looking at now is about the leadership that's needed, how we're going to make change happen within organizations, and, and what reasons people will have for making those changes. So the opening session, we've got um, Rama Girawa from uh, the Helen, Hem Helen Hamlin Institute talking to Johan from uh, Kahoot. Now, um, Rama's been doing some research around what he calls creative leadership, and uh, that's all about finding those leaders and giving them the, the, the space to grow the organizations around them. Um, and so uh, you'll hear a fantastic conversation between Rama and Johan about why Johan built the business he did in the way that he did, and some of the examples that you know, we can all learn from in terms of organizations we're building around us. So uh, over to you, Rama and Johan. Well, hello, Johan. It's really good to see you again. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, you look dressed for the weather. Um, I am. <laughs> <laughs> so as Mark introduced, you know, we have known each other for a while and worked on a lot of inclusive design projects. And we're here to talk about the particular project um, that um, you call Kahoot, which is, um, uh, you know, we'll get a little bit into, into what that is. Um, but I wondered if you might just say a couple of sentences about what it is, where it came from, and, um, you know, the, the effect of it. Um, because I know it's gone global, like literally almost every country on earth uses it. So what is Kahoot? Yeah, uh, Kahoot uh, from outside is an uh, is, um, ed tech company, uh, a company whose mission is to make learning awesome again. So um, the idea was to use uh, gaming, play, um, and all the empathetic things around that to get people engaged in education again, to get students to lean in, to get the kids from the back of the classroom to be engaged for all the right reasons. Um, so the idea of it is to use the, um, the most common game we all know, quiz, to answer the need of the teacher to figure out where's the student, where they are at, what, what's their knowledge, uh, but also for the student to feel seen in the classroom, to do something together with the rest of the classroom, that they together are winning, that they together are creating a wholesomeness. So the idea was to use basically the things we know from the playground that works to create inclusion, uh, to, to help the teacher to uh, get through the curriculum and have engaged students at the end. We thought learning is uh, something awesome, something I want to engage with, something I can see is going to be part of my life. Um, but yeah. the way it's at Outtake, it, it sounds like a very simple thing, but it's it's a quiz show for the classroom. Yeah. And I think it addresses one of those areas of disability or a variance in ability, which is so often ignored. And that's the area of learning, of cognitive abilities, you know, that whole area of mental health, of, um, you know, neurodiversity. And we're, we're all on that spectrum. And it changes according to the day, to, to time, to minutes, to context. 
Um, and I just, one of, one of the most um, seductive videos, if you like, for me as an inclusive designer was seeing this student um, dancing. You were showing this presentation in Oslo and there was a student dancing around the classroom because for the first time in her life, she had solved an equation. So was there, was there a kind of personal motivation for this as well as wanting to look at um, kind of learning abilities across the world? Yeah, absolutely. And I would say, you know, um, the great thing of Kahoot is, um, you know, it's a team. It really is a, a team effort. And the, and the name of Kahoot actually means to do something in, on the, in a naughty way. So I think something I can speak on behalf of everyone who's found Kahoot was this idea that we wanted and we really missed that learning was seen as something you did as a group. It wasn't necessarily a personal endeavor, but actually it's, a group endeavor it's, a, it's, it's something that you do from a societal perspective and then actually we realized a lot of people learn best in social settings um so for me with dyslexia i'm quite reliant on on other people to, to achieve what i want to achieve but at the same time i have some special special things i can give them so for me it was this idea of creating a better learning environment where my strength would come and fun enough classically i struggle with quizzes when you have dyslexia uh, which is the counterintuitive thing, but actually it was yet the quiz was still the best way to get gaming and, and play and all the empathetic things into the classroom. So that's also interesting with inclusive design is the compromise. So yeah, personally, it was this idea that I, I realized my way of getting through education and getting my potential out was the social learning. Um, so that was my reason yeah. for, for coming into Kahoot and, and, and creating it with the rest of the, uh, of the guys there. I always love the value of a personally driven project. And, and I actually want to sw switch modes a little bit and talk about frustration because frustration, the gentle power of dissatisfaction can often drive us forward. But I know when Kahoot is talked about, um, sometimes you're frustrated with the way it's presented. And it maybe talks to the title of this session of how inclusive design helped to build an ed tech unicorn and that story is often missing so can can you tell us a little bit about your your frustration of what is said and what what is the story you would like to get out there yeah it's funny isn't it um a failure has you know no fathers but a success has many mothers um and the more success Kahoot has had, the more it has been put into the old ways of talking about success. You know, the, the amount of people using it, you know, the growth numbers, the financial success in the stock market. Um, you know, most of the, at the point now is, yeah, it's about the dominance of the product and user, gener user, user mass, uh, the partners and what it's worth and how wealthy people have come from it. But what's really interesting is Kahoot is... Uh, it is fundamentally an inclusive design project where the whole business idea and strategy comes from inclusive design. It's through our work with you guys at the Hamlin Hamlin Center and stuff, we actually devise the strategy that underpins the pedagogy, that becomes the business model, that becomes our brand and growth and so on. So it's really interesting. This is very easy for me to, of course, say this, but actually I wish the story in the news was here is uh, a unicorn, you know, uh, a company worth several billion dollars which is based on inclusive design. And that's, that's mm. why we broke the market open. The reason we could make learning actually not just a, a awesome, but actually a very good investment for SoftBank and all of these big institutions is because we did it inclusively. We opened up a new market uh, and, 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 and made it work both pedagogically, but also um, business-wise because it's inclusive. And that's what I think is a really, really interesting story. And it just shows that inclusive design is a very successful business strategy. It's, it's almost like a center of gravity, I, I feel, inclusive design. It's, you know, it's a, it's a little bit like a kind of very positive drug. You know, once you, once you taste it, you're hooked. And, yeah. um, you know, I might have to quote you on your story of um, what you want out there as the headlines. And I, I almost want to go back to the origins of... Um, inclusive design for you you know what was that moment when it attracted you when you were hooked into it when it kind of consciously called you what was that like yeah i mean i've always been interested in design and the ability to you know kind of design for people's needs and so on but actually i have to say 
And that comes a little bit back to, you know, the way it was positioned to me the first time I really interacted with it, because it wasn't about disability. It was about business. It was it was actually designing companies for people with people, right? For, for a better business outcome. Because the analogy was that good business is good for people, not that good business has to be on the, on the contrary to good good for people. So what really um, got me in, and I, that's probably the more call it, call it business part of me, was that, wow, one of the biggest needs of a business is to is to find a wide user group and slowly convert them into users and making sure they're super happy so that they, re, re, they revisit and revisit. And that's what investors would like to see. And I was like, well, here's a strategy where I can use, I can solve the frustration and the real life problem and I can meet my business goals. I can actually convert people into a product and then they'll repeat using it. Wow, here's the strategy for it, called inclusive yeah. design. So, I mean, of course, for me, it was like, it was the business person in me and then it was the designer in me uh, who's found out this is a wholesome strategy that's very, very, um, it's like a winning formula. And, and also it's a little bit like, and nobody else seems to be uh, doing this. That's always a good thing when you're an entrepreneur and want to be first. Yeah. And, and you know, you're, you're implicated in a, the entrepreneurial landscape, you know, in Northern Europe and beyond. Why do you think businesses don't get inclusive design? You know, I have a, I have a passion to expand the identity of it. So it's not just looking at age ability but also gender and race and it's mm. it's open armed stance really allows that mm. but why why don't don't business people get it or do they and are we not hearing the stories well i think the funny thing is where i'm really get excited is a little bit what happened with um with kahoot is that people are doing it and they're doing well they're doing bits of it so they're they have the building blocks in front of them and they are maybe some places doing it but um They've been scared of putting it together and saying it because uh, you know a lot of this either has been seen as disability and it's been said as something that's negative associated. It's not serious. It's you know it's actually something you do to make up the numbers and making sure you're ticking the boxes. Uh, the other one part is that it's from the design side of the company, which often is not valid with like real results. It's a nice to have. Uh, I think we're now moving into a world where. Um, what we call inclusive design is maybe not so interesting, but if people are, are actually doing it, and I would say more and more of the startups I'm involved in are intuitively doing inclusive design because they are, uh, they are like the fundamentals on, on equality. Uh, you know, they know they have to be sustainable. So it's a lot of the things that we want to have an outcome of inclusive design they're already doing, but I think there would be a more, uh, there would be, it would be better for them if they could actually put it into the framework and, and talk about it and execute on it. Um, so it's, we are in a very, it's a very positive state. That's why I think Kahoot's story is so important because people need to see that, look, it works. Yeah. And, you know, staying with the Kahoot story, um, for a while and, you know, many of our participants at this conference will be from companies, will have, um, you know, we'll be talking about how to attract and include people across that range of abilities. You once told a story of um, a parent of an autistic child. And I really wondered if you might share that with us because it was so touching, so heartfelt, but also so, um, um, uh, it, it was so future facing. It, it was a kind of pathway of learning. So I just wondered if you might talk a little bit about that moment. Yeah, I think you know what you're referring to. And I was actually quite early in the product while we were still seeding it into classrooms to to understand if we because one of our strategies, by the way, when you're inclusive is you put your product in, in a controlled environment and you're trying to figure out are you causing more damage than you're doing good? Uh, and actually you're willing to pull back until you find the right formula because one thing is getting growth, but is it growth, you know, and sustainable and adding value? And one of the letters we used in part of our our stuff was that was a mother who emailed us and said, my child, who's autistic, uh, she has never won anything in her life in a school setting. She won Kahoot. But much more important, it's the first time she's been recognized by the other other students that she's an active part of the class and that she knows her stuff, which, of course, was way more valuable for her than the fact that she was best. But the consequence of the fact that the rest of the class looked at her going, wow, she knows all this stuff. You know, she's uh, and then and then it became an interaction where she was part of the classroom. And that was the big victory. For the class and us, I mean, we it literally just, yeah, it was it was magical. I still get tears in my eyes because mm -hmm. for us, 
that was what we set out to do with Kahoot, was to make sure that everyone saw the other students as part of their learning experience. Uh, and this idea of maybe my grade doesn't have to be A, it can be B plus, if that means the rest of the class is winning with me. And that's more important um, because that was one of our frustrations um, was that you leave school and it's all about you and your personal measurements, but then you go into the world and it's all about collaboration. Um, so, so for us, it's like we need to get into the classroom and inclusive design is what people need to learn at school. They need, you don't call it inclusive design, but inclusivity and, and winning together and the idea of the team you're in um, and that, and then showing that, the, that it needs diversity. And it's so fun to see that coming through a mother pointing that out through an autistic child um, and her pride of, you know, the whole classroom coming together. So defining moment for us and evidence we took with us and we used investor presentations, you know, and everyone loves it, but you need to match it with, you know, the business goals and, and so on. Um, and by the way, I'm going to say that's actually when I realized, by the way, you talk about inclusive design and why it's not out there. A lot of business uh, people are not comfortable with the terminology and the language and what it means. So they don't they don't want to talk about it because there's something about being called out or something you don't know what is. Um, so it's also our job to make sure that we are putting it into the into the terminology so that the finance director and non-design CEO and others can actually talk about it in a way that matches their language and their profession. I think that's a that's a really insightful point, um, especially for participants in the in this conference because. You know, I, I do find that sometimes I say in inclusive design, we're trying to do ourselves out of a job. We're trying to, you know, why should the word inclusive be something that's separate? Why is it not baked in and just called design or creativity or action or product or service? Um, and I, I just just wondered if you had any sort of specific thoughts or advice that you might share to people in the similar position. So, you know, think about yourself years ago at that point when you're trying to get the investors on board what was the kind of language that you moderated to speak the truth of inclusive design without necessarily you know holding that terminology or painting people into a corner yeah i very actively had to um, to to use their language and actually the fun, funny in many ways it's the same thing we did when we had to try and explain why social media was such important for the business because Believe it or not, many years ago, social media was kind of, I don't understand what, what, what we need to do with this, right? So you have to convert it into a language they understand. So that goes a little bit where I talked about. So for me, it was to talking about inclusivity. I was talking about having a broader user base to speaking to, to more segments. So I, I took it out of the design language and converted it into business language. So I'm talking about, you know, the funnel, that we were increasing the funnel and we knew the segments and what they needed so we could easily convert them. So it was taking the kind of the, the inclusive design strategy, but portraying it in, in, in what was mat mattered for them, which to be honest, most boardrooms is interested in, you know, what's the cost of acquisition of a user? What's the cost of keeping a user? Mm -hmm. You know, are we addressing their core needs? Are they blah, blah, blah. And actually what's interesting is inclusive design doesn't have to be mentioned in that way, but sometimes when they're wondering why are you getting good numbers? Oh, we have a process. And by the way, it's called inclusive design, right? But what they're interested in is, is the numbers, the conversions, the users, you know, that's what they all have, their metrics that they are driven by. Um, but often they can't repeat success because they don't understand the path coming up. That's when I started talking about inclusive design. If we want to create new products, do new, more things, let's look at what, you know, let's look at what, what, what matters. Um, so that was one of my early ones. And it's really interesting because this is the same way we talked about social media. Um, and I think it's really funny. We thought way back that social media would be a very inclusive um, uh, product for the world we now might see a, a, a different thing but um it's really interesting to see this idea of having to to kind of point at the success factors they recognize as success i think that's where often inclusive design and such things becomes a bit arbitrary and a bit fussy yeah and you know i absolutely chime with that experience and you know the, this thing of language you know i work at a university we work with a lot with business and in the early days we um realize that you know time scales are different in the academy three years to get a phd minimum um could be up to six or for some people even ten um whereas business wants things in three weeks um you know um, in the academy if you share something and other people critique it and you know then it's valid 
mm-hmm. business is often about protecting. So it's been a really interesting journey navigating. Um, but I do feel there's a sort of turning point where ideas of people-centered approaches, closer to the customer, equity, diversity, social design, I'm throwing lots of terms here, um, but you almost, you know, using those terms carefully to be able to curate the conversation and have access to the conversation has yep. been really important. And one of the things I see happening now is actually being able to change or direct the conversation. So, yep. you know, we worked with an airline who had their KPIs, the key performance indicators. Um, and we had this, this moment halfway through the project where we said they keep on coming back to the KPIs. Let's have a conversation with them about changing the KPIs to not just being about performance, but being about people, plane, and place. Uh, and what came out was a kind of richer look. Um, so do you feel that there, there, there is a, a tipping point? Is there a change from, you know, 10 years ago when we started our conversation? Yeah. You know, what's changed, good or bad? No, uh, yeah, and good and bad, as always, how we have to kind of <laughs> direct ourselves. You know what, what what came at the same time as the book about you know inclusive design and designing with people and so on was also the framework of Alexander Osterwalder about doing um, business modeling. And that actually, you could take the business model canvas and look at an inclusive design perspective. You can actually put inclusive strategy in there and you would actually get a better result when you're modeling future business models. And at the same time, Eric Rice kind of with his book and really got agile and this whole startup methodology into, into companies, which is also is very design driven and has this idea of input and research and feedback loops and so on, which very much speaks to include the design. Now that's been come, that's become the everyday fabric of startups and large organizations. And it's much easier now to, to connect that with inclusive design strategies uh, because people are now much more, um, they have much better call it KPIs internally to understand design, build, learn, blah, 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 processes, which you need to be able to have an inclusive design uh, strategy. So I think we are on a turning point now when you're going to have more companies like Kahoot talked about as actually based on these strategies. And that's the reason why we won. Because there's one thing that I learned from the business world as well is people are looking for success formulas and they want to be able to predict the future. Um, because that's what they invest in, right? That your ability to do it again and again and again. When they start realizing there's a there's a sound strategy, a repeatable strategy, they love it. Uh, mm-hmm. But it takes 10, 15 years sometimes for these strategies to embed all the way into organizations, become uh, you're well, well worse than it. Yeah. So do we need to be talking to business schools as well? You know, I, I, I spoke to a, a company um, who said we've hired 27 people, 22 nationalities, different um, kind of ages, abilities, um, you know, genders and races. So they 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 kind of met that criteria, met that ambition, intention. But they said because they've all come from different business schools that are teaching pretty much the same stuff, the you know traditional um, uh, materials, they all think the same. Yeah. So how, how do we reconcile that? No, I, I think you're spot on. I actually think like it's much more exciting for me to go into a business school and talk about inclusive design, particularly about Kahoot and, and the financial success than a design school. Because a design school, one, people actually already think, oh, I know this and design process and so on, or they're interested, but they feel like they know it. But for a business, uh, in a business environment and the schools, they are they provoke, provo- they find it provocative or they find it, wow, okay, here's a differentiator for me. And because they can point towards financial success, which often is important, right? Or some of them are very obsessed about or designing the organization, which I also think includes design. It's a very strong tool to actually look at how you design your organization so you can, your outputs can actually work really well in inclusive design because it's a big part of Kahoot. Uh, we took yeah. a learning from Spotify, but it was this idea of being able to create an organization who can think, act, and produce uh, from an inclusive design perspective to understand that you have expertise and passions within the organization that's not necessarily follows the normal, the normal hierarchy. So you start, you start designing guilds of people interested in accessibility or you know, or cultural differences or whatever it is, which is vital for the product development, but not necessarily follows the normal hierarchy of a developer, designer, and so on. Um, so we do need to speak to business schools because I do think the way we organize as our companies is a vital part of inclusive design as well. 
so it, it sort of leads on to another question of, you know, there's there's research out there um, from various people, you know, including McKinsey universities, uh, other management consultancies that show that if you have a variance by ability as well as age, gender, and race, um, but you know, having a variance across the ability spectrum makes your company more intelligent, more patents result, the bottom line is affected, the happiness index goes up, all of these things are there. So can inclusive design be described as a USP for business, for startups? Should we be talking about it as that? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think because you could, as you said, you could have all the all the variants there, but if you don't have a system for it, they're they're there and they by fact will of course increase the output and it will create more diversity. But actually when you put inclusive design in, being able to tap in and organize and systematically get the best out of uh, out of it is where it becomes a USP. It becomes an unfair advantage. We actually talk about a new company are doing now. Our unfair advantage is that we're putting together an unusual mix of people and organizations that normally would be an explosion, but because of having an inclusive design uh, approach to it, it becomes our unfair advantage because we can take out the potential in it. Um, and that's what often what happens when people want to have a homogeneous culture, it's easier to manage it. But actually, if you have a good process for having you know, a diverse culture, uh, you don't get the crash and burn, you get the X factor and you win. I, I love that, Johan. It almost could be an advert for inclusive design. Do you want an unfair advantage? Use inclusive design. But it's true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's very it true. So, um, I want to just bring it back briefly to the human side because that's where we started. And there's a sort of couple of couple of thoughts and questions I wanted to tease out. One is um, the peer-to-peer -peer aspect of Kahoot absolutely speaks to a level of equity and inclusivity, mm -hmm. you know, baked into the learning strategies and structures. So there's not a figure of authority it's 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 that sort of peer learning and peer shaping and you know it strikes me that you guys didn't fall into the app trap that so many people at the time did where you want to design an app sell it to one of the major tech companies create a community that you can sell the app to um so you know you create the app create a community sell the app to the community and then sell the company on but the, the intentionality of Kahoot felt so um, human, mm. so peer to peer, so person to person. And I just wondered if you can speak a little bit about that, because it always touches my heart when you see whether it's 3000 older people or, you know, three kids working together. Um, there is that genuine equity there. So where did that come from? How did you build that in? Yeah, I mean, I guess it's our ambition. I guess, guess everyone is different, but our ambition was that we thought if you can really create these magical learning moments between someone. So there's actually a video on our website still where you see two kids in a space center in South Africa solving a math problem together, and they're doing it in pairs. And they, when they get it right, they jump and they hug each other and high five. And this this idea of of, of winning together was we we designed for those moments. We actually. When we started the company, we put some expressions down we wanted. We took the guy standing in the boardroom with his hands up saying, I got it right, you know, the personal victory and the and, and those things. And then we had the people hugging and doing a team one. And then you have the group chair. So finding out all, all these human emotions which define success, and we designed for them. And we thought they're not present in classrooms. And that's interesting. If you're thinking 10 years back, mobile phones, music, dancing, you know, high fives, all these game and human expressions, they weren't there. So that was one of the things we designed for the inner child to come out. Um, and that was very important for us because we thought that that was lacking. We thought that's what's lacking in education, this idea of, of human celebration and being yourself, but also getting recognition from others. And this idea that we talk about when you go to, conf when you go to a concert and you get you know, these 15 seconds of fame when, when you're shouted at or you know, what, all those things, we, we wanna be part of something greater than ourselves. So that was a big part of the Kahoot uh, foundation. And actually, it was funny you saying about the app stuff because, and this comes from our inclusive design, we realized that investors want to hear you're doing an app business because that's what gets funding. But we are not going to meet our 
objective of getting the whole class to take part if it is not an app. We're going to have to do a web interface because mm -hmm. anyone with any phone or any computer can take part. And that was more important for us to have success in the real kind of objective of the business than call it the short-term goal of getting to an investor saying, hey, I'm designing an app. Um, and then we were smart enough to realize if we're doing that, our numbers will look awesome because every time we get a classroom, we get 30 kids and use multiple that. So we knew our numbers would look really good for investors. So it's something about a confidence in doing an inclusive strategy as well and knowing we took the classroom. And we for years resisted the app uh, strategy because to your point, we did build the community first. Our whole, our whole idea was we have to get a community behind us who's going to tell us how this product needs to become. So we spent our time actually fostering a community that actually kind of took the app in use, the app, web app, the web application it was, and we started learning from it. Um, so we were also a community first organization. And that was, that's what the point of the name, right? Kahoot, doing something together in an auto way. So we said the teachers and the students are in Kahoot for better education. Uh, and that was our go to market um, to make sure that it was something students and teachers did together against not against yeah. it. it wasn't it didn't come from administrator or the, or the government it came from the students that teach together and they were kind of naughty yeah <laughs> i i almost love i love that kind of alternative way um of thinking about things and there's so many alternatives that are that are in your story the community first rather than you know it's it's sort of people first strategy second um which is something that really speaks to myself so um, you know, I really wanted to end by asking you one question, and it's something we've spoken about a lot over the, the years. Um, and, you know, in front of this audience um, of um, tech-driven innovators, um, people working across accessibility and inclusivity, what is it that you think the world needs to actually address these issues? What is the human values that you think we need to, to live and lead by example. And I know, you know, in creative leadership, I speak about empathy, clarity, and creativity. But in the past, you've spoken about some, some very human values that the world needs, and that's the thing that will take us forward. So I really wanted you to have the last word speaking to that. Yeah, it's interesting. I over the last couple of years, I've seen people talking, when we talk about sustainability, talk about social sustainability. You know, we have climate sustainability, we have social sustainability. And this idea that um, for us to feel, uh, all, or actually to meet all the goals when we talk about business goals, it's actually the human connection um, that becomes the kind of the thing that people desire the most and value the most. That, you know, happiness lies in connecting with a, com with a community and be part of, of something greater than yourself. And my definition of community is to be part of something greater than yourself, to move mountains bigger than yourself. And I actually, I would say, you know, to draw it back to the world's most valuable company, Apple, a lot of people don't talk about it, but actually a lot of success factors for Apple is they've always been very inclusive um, in their technology and what the way they're talking about. And it's one of their unfair advantages. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with that they're tapping into that you can tap into and be a creator and you, you're part of a community of other creators and so on. So, uh, you know, it comes down to their voice recognition and other things, but like, we should point more at the successes out there who are widely successful for why they're successful, not just because of their sales numbers, that because they they are fostering human connection. Yeah. And, you know, I, I have a forthcoming book called Creative Leadership, which you are very kindly one of the major case studies there. And I almost want to end by quoting back yourself, which is one of the things that you said that if you had a magic wand, you would wave this in the world is to create more joy. And I think that's what Kahoot is. That is what you are, my friend, in the network of entrepreneurism and sustainability that you're creating. So we'd love to end with your final words of creating more joy. Totally agree with myself. <laughs> Well, that was great, wasn't it? Um, uh, Johan, such an inspiration, and, and, and Rama, uh, fully on board with all of that enthusiasm and joy and magic that he's talking about. And, and I love the way that uh, Johan refers to a community moving a mountain that's bigger than we could do on our own.